So we don't know who the candidates are yet, much less what policy is going to pursue. But based on what we know so far, we do have two leader and candidates, uh, one of whom is president now and one of whom was president. So we have some hints, at least, about where they're going. As you look forward for global Wall Street, what should we be looking at? Well, I think it's important to set the stage. So we've got short-term issues, obviously, with the effects of monetary policy on the economy. We have budget challenges. But we also have long-term opportunities and challenges from the country, from uh, generative AI and other very good developments for productivity. The question is, are we going to be able to grab those? What strikes me in looking at least at President Biden and former President Trump's policies is less how different they are than how similar they are. So in terms of protectionism, in terms of a fondness for industrial policy, in terms of intervention in financial markets, the two men are more similar than they are different. There are clearly some differences and important ones between the two. But I think for business people, understanding that neither of these gentlemen is really embracing a growth and opportunity agenda is front and center. So that's rather surprising. We don't hear that too often, how similar Donald Trump is to Joe Biden. But let's talk about some other issues here uh, about populism and particularly, for example, uh, the independence of the central banks. That's something that has been sort of sacred in the United States for years and years, right? Uh, what about that? Do both of them regard the independence of the, of the Federal Reserve equally? Well, I, I think there are very important populist challenges. One is the Fed. So we're in an environment where I at least think interest rates will be higher for longer than many market participants seem to believe. That's an environment where anti-Fed sentiment it will be building on both sides of the aisle. And the question is, will the candidates honor the Fed's independence? I certainly hope so. It's very important for the country. A second populist challenge really is in globalization. You know, the song about, you know, you're going to miss me when I'm gone. <laughs> That's going to be true for globalization. And it's going to be true if we threaten the trade and prosperity that has made our country great. And then the third area is domestic politics. You know, the, the, the real trick in helping people cope with technological advances like generative AI and with globalization is to move people to new opportunities, not to promise them the past. But both of these candidates are doing the opposite. They are promising the past. That's really the challenge of populism. How do you give people a bridge to the future rather than promising them a wall for the past? And how can we afford it? Because the debt and deficit is a big issue uh, that's facing this country at some point. We certainly haven't been willing to deal with it yet. Do we have any sense that one of these individuals, Donald Trump or Joe Biden, is more willing to step up to the bar and really a deal with entitlements? I wish I could tell you the answer is yes. The answer is clearly no. Neither one, in fact, neither party is interested at the moment. But that they must for two reasons. One is we have to make choices. We're going to need to increase defense spending, probably on the order of a percentage point of GDP or more. Not only in the United States, but around the world, we're going to have to make some choices between defense and social spending. You know, going back to everybody's favorite course economics, guns and butter, <laughs> we're, going to be, we're going to be back to that. Uh, and the second is we've got budget challenges that have to be addressed. Social Security trust funds, Medicare trust funds will be running out in the coming decade. Either candidate ultimately will have to do something. So I'm not asking you who you're going to vote for. I'm not sure you even know who you're going to vote for. But are there candidates out there with economic policies that you think are different from the similarities you see potentially between Donald Trump and Joe Biden? Well, I think there are. There's certainly a number of prominent Democrat politicians that differ. They're not running for president. On the Republican side, uh, Governor Haley is clearly an example. Her record in South Carolina was saying, rather than talking about the past, let's try to give people a bridge to the future. And South Carolina, of course, brought in new industries, new ways of doing businesses. That's the kind of discussion we need to have. We need a real discussion between, are we going to help people with policies that get them to a new place, or are we just going to promise them the past? Can you have those policies get into a place without basically spending more money and borrowing more money? Yes and no. So no in the sense that helping people is going to cost money. I have in mind ideas that would help places left behind, uh, ideas that would help training and community colleges. Those aren't free. They're, however, nickels on the dollar of what we're spending in some of our larger social programs. We should be able to make choices, whether it's minor tax increases, whether it's changes in entitlement spending that help us do that. So, so one of the things that we always hear is it's all about pocketbook issues ultimately in elections. That's what people vote. That could be a good thing or a bad thing. As you look right now, uh, what is the pocketbook issue going to be for this year? And I guess more pointedly, 
Why is it that the American people don't really seem to feel the economy is in a good place? Because there are a lot of indicators that it says it's not in a bad place at all. That's true, but I think the American people are right. I think what most people are feeling is the pressure of inflation and higher prices. So as economists, we say, well, inflation may be coming down. But to a person who's buying goods and services, prices are still high. And it's very hard for wages to keep up with that. So a lot of average Americans uh, are still struggling. And there's also the longer term fears. People know the roiling changes that are coming in the world from technology. And they're wondering, do they and their children have a seat at that table? So both the current pocketbook issue and the longer run, I think, really rivet most Americans. Do you think there's a certain just delay in getting your arms around the fact that the gas is coming back down in price, for example, or the price of bread isn't going up as fast anymore? There are some people who say it's six months, it's a year before people really, it sets in that actually inflation is not that big a problem anymore. Well, inflation will be coming down. I'm, I'm not sure it's going to come down as fast to 2% as the Fed seems to believe it is. But prices, the level of prices, when people go to the grocery store, those are still high. And people's wages are not rising as fast. But there are a lot more jobs. I mean, you would think that that might sort of counterbalance it to some extent. I mean, they, this, there have been a lot of jobs created under this administration. There have. And, and I think that's a very, very good thing. But I think people are still worried about employment prospects and they're worried about the purchasing power of their wages. And I think importantly, they do blame the government for some of the lost in purchasing power and they're not wrong. We have a lot of challenges facing us, geopolitically, politically, any way you look at it. I, I think at least going back in history, innovation has often been the answer for the United States here. Uh, what do we need to do to make sure innovation comes to the rescue once again? Well, innovation is the answer. But the answer toward innovation can't be target industrial policy from Washington. It shouldn't be a president, a college professor, anybody who decides what innovation is. It should be up to the, the market. What the government needs to do is really ramp up support for basic research and ideas and applied research around the country. And we will get the innovation that this country is good at. We then have to help more Americans cope with that innovation. Innovation sounds great if you're a scientist or a business person. It might be a little bit less great for some others. We need to help everybody along. Do we, a, do we need a program right now to determine what AI will do to jobs and where we can help some of those individuals that may lose their jobs? Well, we need to start thinking about it. In the past, new general purpose technologies, that is technologies that are so big they bring everything along like AI, those have led to as many new jobs or more as the jobs they destroyed. The jury's still out on AI, but we have time if we focus.